Stephen Lang. Sir Courtney Weaver. Woo! John Landau. And writer, director, co-editor, and producer, James Cameron.
it, yes, I, I observe kids in classes, and I kind of unearthed my own memories of my 14-year-old, which was not a great time in my life, but I remember it very vividly. By the time I got to the volume where you step in and you know, you're in your little suit, you become the character, it was almost like I felt Curie just push me away and say, leave me alone. And I just had to get out of her way. So there was no time when I went, oh, that's a little adult. It was so, that's the glory of this technology is that without sitting in makeup, without, uh, you know, costumes and lighting and all that stuff, you're allowed to let this, this, this energy, this sort of fire just burst forth and they are, they capture it somehow. And you just have to get out of the character's way. It is that true to what's going on in here. And I'm sorry that the uh, people maybe can't, I wish everyone, all the actors could try it because it's, it's actually so, it's able to take whatever you give it and that's the amazing thing. And then, you know, so I'm just, I'm very pro this. I feel it was incredibly liberating. And I don't think I could have played Gary, obviously, for, you know, for physical reasons, but also just for, for emotional reasons, I felt I was in the perfect place to do that. If I could just interject there, you know, I've, I've watched you play these highly intelligent, competent, forceful women twice with aliens and then with the first avatar, your character, Grace Augustine. And I've always thought of your process as being in your head first and then accessing your heart afterwards. <clears throat> what I observed was the opposite on this one. You got, you, as you said, you got out of your own way. You de-intellectualized your process and just made it acting from the, the inside out in such a natural way. And I don't think you were aware of it. And I've, I've commented on this to other people that I don't know if I've said it to you. There was a lightness of spirit when you stepped into the volume. I didn't see you that much during the whole process outside of the volume, because I was usually in there working when you when you came in. When you cross that line, and it's imagine it's just a painted line on the ground like the edge of a tennis court. When you stepped into that volume, you got younger. And I don't think you were aware of it. And, and you're not particularly mathy. I've never thought of you that way. But, what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't speak to you. You're so serious. <laughs> it's still a mystery of it after all these years. But there was there was something that was just younger, more more buoyant, and more radiant about you. Now the character has her kind of depressive and anxious moments, clearly, but she also has true joy in her interaction sometimes with other characters like like Duke and sometimes with the natural world. And I just observed something that I hadn't seen before. Yeah, no, I, I felt it was just a magical space where we could let it all go. And um, and I actually found it a very neurotic place because I felt my most neurotic period coming out in the volume, um, but not continuously. But I mean, that's the kind of safe space it was for actors. Um, and, and so I'm very grateful to you for coming up with this. Thank you. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun to do. Just to, just just to, to reiterate, reiterate that. My brief basically was to get as big and strong as I possibly could be. And, and, I, and in so many ways, the, the character flowed from that. It's a very, you know, I hope that doesn't sound shallow and simple, but that, that really was my road in. And then on this one, um, you know, it's never, it has not been noted, except I've noted it to myself, that I too was playing a younger character, a younger version of, of myself. And of course, as I play it, I, I myself am 10 or 12 years older than I was when, when, I, when I did it. And the brief on this one, of course, was, was quite, quite different because I don't have to supply the physical size in here, but what I do have to supply is the kind of agility and the flexibility that this character would naturally have. So that was a real tester for me because it, it, it doesn't come, you know, the other thing, the, the weights and the, all that comes easier to me. So that was a great, great challenge. And I think that to take that, the, the, if you take what I just said 
as kind of a metaphor for the, the inner workings of the character, I think it, it operates there too. I was trying to you know, open myself up to you know, more agile thinking uh, so that I could be more in tune. I think that, you know, Quaritch is, a, Quaritch is an intelligent man. And I think that he finally intuits <laughs> that, he, uh, uh, that he really needs to come to it rather than, you know, bring it to him. It's just not going to work out. So uh, we explore a lot of interesting stuff, though. You know, the fact that he doesn't even know if he's him right. anymore. You know, am I that guy that I was before? So as an actor, it's interesting. You created a character then. Is your new character that guy? Or is he a guy that's imprinted with some of those memories and personality, as you said, but evolving into something else? We did a lot of questions. We, I mean, we did ask questions like that quite a bit. That, that would have been, you know, a big part of the dialogue that Jim and I had in, in an ongoing way. And you know, it's important to ask the questions and then you, you walk away from the conversation without a definitive answer, but you actually, then you do the scene and the answer manifests itself to the extent that it does, it seems to be. You know, the one thing that's operating there that, that is, is um, there's confusion in a character who is not at all accustomed to confusion. He's a straight ahead direct thinker. And now he's quite confused, and I put that, I, I attribute that to the way of water, which is flowing through him uh, as well. Ewa will have her way, it seems to me. And that, that you were, your character was in an adversarial relationship with the planet yeah. the first time, with the strength, you know, this place will shit you up dead if you don't, if you don't come to it with strength adversarially. And then he walks off the, the, the ship and takes his mask off and he's breathing air. Now he's... Who, you know, who is he? Is he Navi? Is he, is he who he was? You know? Well, it's the great irony, of course. Of These are the kind of conversations we have. These wonderful writers, Jim and the writers, did is that when you become the thing that you've been attempting to destroy, I mean, then, 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 then who, you know, who are you? It's a, the, whole, the whole damn thing for him is this existential crisis. You know, <laughs> is what it is, you know. Yeah. And that, I mean, that really truly is why I believe the Hamlet moment is in the, is in the film and, and that it was his idea. Well, I, the I, Hamlet I, thing with the skull was, I give you 100% credit for that. He, he sent me, I think it was in an email. He said, you know, I think Quirch, first thing he'd do is he'd go find that amp suit find out what happened to him himself. Because he says right in the, in the dialogue, I'm not gonna remember my own death, yeah. you know? And so picking up his skull, that was actually an image you gave me. It was, so you didn't like it. <laughs> it seemed like, I think it was a dream that I had and it was just something to pass on. So it was a, you know, it's a, it's a great credit to the confidence of the, of the, of the writer here that, that he would incorporate it. And, and thank you for attributing it to me. I, well, Steven's a, Steven's a writer. Steven's a screenwriter as well. And we've got a couple of other screenwriters which I talked to at some point. Yeah. I, I think that's a great moment, and there are so many great moments that are, that are deep. And the writing was a very safe place. And so Jim came in and said a lot of things at the beginning, one of which is we want to tell a family saga. And so we immediately got excited. Uh, it was also important that uh, everything works scientifically. It has to make sense scientifically. So uh, I, you know, I knew more about the body and Pandora than I know what's in my backyard. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was always, though, the mantra really was uh, leading with the heart and emotion and connection. And so uh, as the characters came to life in the room um, and relationships developed between those characters, and then the themes started to make themselves known. And, uh, and then it really did become finding the marriage between that and then the, the plot and the action. So, I mean, one of the things that we're most proud of with the movie is that, uh, you know, especially if you just, just consider a moment, the last, you know, big action push in the film, you never lose track of a single character and what's going on with that character. And it's not just their location, more importantly, it's, it's where they are emotionally and we were always um, working very hard then to understand what the audience's relationship was to that, the character's emotion. 
By the way, I just want to uh, round of, ask for a round of applause too for the amazing cast that surrounds Sigourney and Stephen, by the way. All the kids who play uh, uh, Dick and it's including and uh, uh, Jack Champion, who plays Spider, who's phenomenal. So congratulations to all of them. Um, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, I think when you guys have made two. Yeah. In the Emmy of well, it happens it's a number of times. It's in the tank. In yeah. Oh yeah, you know, talk about yeah, big exactly. Yeah. Well, that was a great. We did that right in the beginning, and I, I just remember, you know, she's in this too, and Natiri is my wonderful mother, but so is this uh, person, and I just thought you'd want to just jump up and try to hug this person through the glass and. Um, I remember it was it was so much fun because of course I know I'm supposed to be seven feet tall and I hadn't really thought about the scale but um, once I clambered up there uh, it just felt you know that's the thing I felt like you know you were able to let these let these instincts really go and um, and that, that that we were the way we were shooting. It was elastic enough to incorporate any any kind of thing you came up with in the moment, and so I remember that was a very uh, a, a very formative moment for me because I was able to use my physicality in an emotional way. Well, think about the day where she was she was in the spirit world and she was meeting her mother, and so Sigourney had to quickly switch back and forth between you know Grace who's very, you know, she's this very competent, scientific, you know, person, but also quite loving. And then switch to the, the daughter who just needed some emotional support and she did play the scene to herself. So we had a very trusted double, Alicia Bell Bailey, that Sigourney worked with. We did an interesting thing, which was Alicia would do some of the things that, that Sig couldn't physically do, like leap up onto the tank like a like a 15-year-old, like a 15-year-old not be gazelle girl, you know. And and I said, okay, I don't want to direct Alicia. I want you to direct Alicia. And I wanted you guys to sort of go off and create a, a relationship of trust where the things you couldn't physically do, you could tell Alicia how to do it for you. That was my memory of it. And, and so I basically said, okay, that, that director role I assigned to you to, so, that, so that Alicia would do how you saw Kiri yeah. acting and moving and, and so on for the, for the pit. Now, she really did, I don't know, 90% of her own stuff, including everything underwater and all that sort of thing. But there are a few things. Oh, it was wonderful to, to reach out to an, uh, Alicia, who's so, such a brilliant um, movement person, and just, her, talk to her about her 14 year old and, and just how you move and how you feel and what you're covering and where you're hiding. And um, so it was really a, it was, it was like a sisterhood, you know, for us to do it that way. And that scene, when I saw it in the movie, I couldn't believe it, the scene where I, where Kira sees Grace and they have that embrace. I know when we shot it, it was sort of disjointed I couldn't really imagine, it was like a vision, I couldn't really imagine what it would be like to see it, and, and um, it, it was, um, I think it looks very nice. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I had a dream-like quality in the, in the way the dreams don't have logic, but they feel very powerful, regardless. So I was just gonna say that uh, you touched on something that I think uh, about performance caption. I don't know if, if you all would agree with this or not, but aside from being the actor, uh, uh, playing chords, the actor playing Kitty. Um, we're also, I feel, the stewards of these roles, and which is to say, we're sort of the first among equals in a way, because uh, because there's so many people who do contribute to the playing of this role. And as this project moves forward, look, my response. Oh, you're talking about the troop. I'm talking. Uh, I was going to get in. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Go ahead. Uh, my my. My responsibility as an actor is to do the best I can do with Quaritch, and my responsibility as a steward is to make sure that Quaritch is the best that he can possibly be, which is to say that as this work advances uh, and the, 
there's all this physical stuff to be done, I'm perfectly aware that there are going to be things that I can't do. Now, I know this is elementary that, you know, there's people have always had to stun people and everything like that, but it's different during this performance capture, it seems to me, that we really are, um, and, and, and it, it just requires this kind of letting go of your ego to, to an extent, you know, uh, uh, that you really You're a very athletic guy, and you did, I mean, Stephen and I would start the day at 6 a.m. basically kicking the shit out of each other, <laughs> kickboxing training, Muay Thai training. And, and continue he's, on the set. He's a pretty strong. He's a pretty strong. We get it out of the way, you know, early in the morning. But uh, no, he's a pretty physical, physical guy. But I think what you're saying is, as we go on toward movie four, movie five, you know, we come in with our walkers and our oxygen tube up our nose. There might not be some things we can do. Yeah. No, but the thing is, we have a way. Now, if you think about the way you do stunts when you have a stunt double. Something that has to kind of hide his face, you have to use lighting or silhouette or, or whatever. But if we have something that, that uh, is very specific, and Stephen was great at everything, the movement, the gun handling, all that sort of thing, the riding with the creatures and everything. But there were a couple things that we wound up doubling. But we can actually do what we call FPR. So in the way that, that you might have somebody do efforts or dialogue later in ADR for sound to put with the stuff that will make it feel more like uh, the actor playing the character. And you know, if, if you're anybody but Tom Cruise, you, you, you get doubled at some point, right? Um, and he's gonna get that locker at some point too. <laughs> but the point is, after his facial performance replacement, so Steven can see what the double has done, and then we can record his facial performance to match the timing and the effort, movement, cadence of, of what the, the, uh, the double had done. And then it's actually his face. You see, it's actually the character's face. So we could go, we could come out of a, a stunt right into essentially a close up without a cut if we want to. And it becomes, it's, it's continuously Steven throughout that. It's kind of, it's kind of amazing. The, the thing about performance capture is it's not a panacea. There are things you can do that are better than live action photography, the things that are a little bit more challenging. It's a question of choosing your artificiality, you know. Uh, acting for camera is a highly artificial, very stylized process. You know, we, we think of it as natural because we've been doing it for 120 years. But if you think about it, if you've got a master and a two shot and some loose overs and uh, some tight close ups, that's six setups. Average five takes, that's 30 times the actor has to do the same damn thing over and over, at least same enough that it can match so the editors can put it all together. Right? Or you could do one take in performance capture and extract all that coverage from it later, which gave us a lot of flexibility. We didn't have to stick to a master. We didn't have to stick to what we'd done. We could be on take five and completely rearrange the staging if we weren't happy with the way it was going. Um, and you can extract all the coverage from a single take. And we didn't always do that. And we'd take bits and pieces from different takes as you normally would in editing, but we could if, if we wanted to. So for us, it was just an exploration. Let's just find, you're always moving toward the truth of the scene as, you, as you're going along. You can leave those earlier takes behind you like they, they, they don't even exist. I've been uh, bring some so many ideas. I'm going to uh, get back into to a few of them in a second. But I, I got to say, Jim, I, I know that the lighting, the cinematography, the backlight, the soft light, the edge light, whatever it is, the shadow play on the walls, the light through the window, all that, we're going to do that later. The dolly track, the mic booms, the crane, how we move the camera, all that. I'm going to do it all later with a virtual camera that I can move. I, I can use a handheld camera platform, essentially me, to do everything, to be a helicopter, to be a crane, to be a steady cam, to do all those things. Well, I'll do it all later. So when I'm working with, with my incredible cast, I'm just focusing on character and performance. And, and to a certain extent, staging, I have to imagine how I might cover it later. But whenever a director's setting a scene, they run around with their, their viewfinder or however they do it, and they know what their coverage is gonna be in their mind, but then they shoot it that day. I shoot it a year later. So Oliver Stone came in, I was talking through my process, you know, our, this, this process that we used, and I said, yeah, we've completely uncoupled the camera and the lighting from the acting. 
And he said, why the fuck would you want to do that? <laughs> the answer is because I, I cannot worry about all that stuff. I don't have to worry. If I was doing Titanic, I wouldn't have to worry about a thousand extras in the background of, of uh, you know, Kate and Leo. Um, I don't have to worry about the forest, the sun going down, you know, some big fire effect or smoke or whatever it is. You know, we don't have to set 50 smudge pots and then reset them. Whatever it is, you know, just imagine anything that you would need in a scene for background. 50 cars all going back to one. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. We just focus on what we're doing now. You could say, yeah, but you don't have the 50 cars there to inform the actors of, oh, they're on the street in New York. You think an actor, especially actors so accomplished from, from stage as, as the actors that, that I'm working with, can't imagine 50 cars? They can fucking imagine they're on a planet with floating mountains. They can imagine anything, you know? Um, and really, I think, uh, I'm speaking for you guys, and, and feel free to jump in, it's the other actors' eyes that you need, right? I mean, really what it gave us an opportunity to do was you know, some of the, a lot of these scenes are, are, you know, are very, a lot happens in them and there's a lot at stake. And so really, like an early theater rehearsal, where you're trying to figure out, you know, everything about the play. You know, you're trying to sort of, every, every time you start to rehearse a scene, you're, you're really going at it to sort of take it apart and put it back together and really, really experience it. So that's what we were doing instead of worrying about the lights and everything. We were really exploring these scenes, seeing really what would Jacob and Terry, what would the marriage be experiencing now in this circumstance? And what would the children be feeling and thinking when they had to listen to their parents fight through that tent? So it's, it was all like, let's find it. It gave you the opportunity and the luxury to have that time to find it, because even though it's written, you still have to find it emotionally. Also, there's a, the, not only are, are the actors individually uh, working on what Sid's talking about, but there's a, there's a collective imagination is at work as well. And that's really, really, really important. You get into some of the most fundamental acting stuff. You get into Stella Adler uh, territory big time there because you really, I remember one time we were, we were trekking through a swamp. And, uh, and at some point, it's just, ah, you know, there's all these, there's a lot of bugs in the swamp. There's a lot, you know, uh, don't you people know that? And it's like, you know, I didn't know there were a lot of bugs in the swamp. <laughs> so then we started to went through it. Everyone was, everybody was, ow, 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 ow. Like, like, okay, there aren't that many bugs in the swamp. <laughs> you know, so, but, but, but as an exercise in kind of collective imagination, as well as individual need, you, you know, what, what, what does each actor need, uh, is their deal, and what are we taking from what the environment is giving us, which we need to agree on that environment, what it is. You know, well, that's why we went to Hawaii, too, so we could do that kind of two or three day sense memory experiment, be in the forest. I mean, you walk through a forest, you walk on a path, whether it's in Hawaii or wherever, you don't think a lot about how do I place my feet? What do I do with my hands? What does it feel like when the leaves brush past me? How does that influence how I move? How do I assess before the fact what I know I can just push out of the way without, or, or where do I have to actually do something? Anything that would come back and influence the performance later, I'm talking about just a simple physical performance. You know, we had to start to think about that. And so we went on this really kind of deep dive sense memory experiment. We did it above water in the rainforest in, in uh, Kauai, and we also did it, uh, um, uh, you know, offshore. And, and we did some diving exercises offshore. We did some scuba diving um, on the reef. Everybody got, you know, got trained on scuba, got trained in breath hold diving. You've got to go out into the real world. You can't come back into this, into this um, environment where so much is going to be created with CG without a deep grounding in the reality of what you're doing and how you're moving. That. And, and I think that the downstream process, which is working with the effects people, is all about observation. So I would encourage them, I, I tell them, you know, on the weekend, just go out and just look at things. Look at light through a leaf. You know, look at things. Look at how water drifts off a leaf. What happens when it hits the ground? What happens when rain hits leaves? How do they move? Because you've got to do it all. 
and and you've got you know sure you can have physics-based simulations to do it. So you know there's that sort of highly logical, highly precise side of my mind that's doing that, attempting to recreate the beauty and the wonder and the reality of the natural world, and the other side of it, trying to you know uh, work work with you guys so that you could take in that reality, that observation, and then bring it back into that relatively austere volume environment. And remember, and the bugs are a good example. <laughs> and sometimes it takes somebody saying, hey, are there bugs? You know, right. or right. Me, oh, hey guys, remember the freaking mosquitoes when it got dusk, you know? And then, and then yeah, the, then it turns into Keystone Cop where everybody starts swapping bugs, <laughs> <laughs> you know? One of the great things we did when we went to Hawaii, though, Jim talked about the rainforest and touched on the water. We went on perhaps the most Pandoran-like experience that one can have on Earth. We went on a night dive. We went to the bottom, 30 feet down, sat down in the dark, and out of the darkness came giant manta rays. Talk about Pandora. And they came so close, you could touch them. And that's right, they came and would swim over the mornings, the curse for trouble getting to come up to the surface. He was so tragic. I, I thought about that moment and that opportunity that we gave to cast Sigourney when there's a scene in this movie where the stingray, the Pandora stingray goes by her and she reaches out and I harken back to that night when we were at the bottom of the ocean and given that opportunity you were talking about. Right. And, and it was actually I think it was a plastic fish with some plastic streamers on it on the end of the stick. Or something. <laughs> something was like that. that was the right. That was the writer's room. What do you think is the this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next time the writers are going scuba diving. Right. <laughs> <laughs> something that, uh, that Stephen and Jim both said I mean, in terms of the word imagination. I'm wondering that. I mean, it's, it's something your work has long been known for. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that in writing this, there, there's no sense of anything that can't be done. I'm wondering, uh, as as the script was coming together, if there was ever sort of this sense of like of of, of a freedom in some ways that you had never experienced before, just having knowing that anything you could imagine was going to be able to be there uh, on screen, anything you put on the page, right? Uh, there was a, it was a complete freedom. We've talked about this in terms of movie. Two, coming movie two and three, that we had a lot of material, and a lot of it was uh, uh, just kind of building this fantastic world. And it became clear in the beginning that there's going to be a lot. So we asked him, should we start cutting back now? And we oh, put more. And, and Jim, <laughs> I think the email back was take the hill, hmm. which we knew very well. Just don't edit yourself, just go. And it was. Uh, and it was very freeing. And it was also the kind of thing that no matter what we came up with, or obviously Jim, but you know, Josh and Shane, who was also in the room with us, whatever we came up with, we knew that someone would figure out how to do it. And not only that, but, but nail it. Well, we also knew from the first film that, you know, you could, as writers, I think we tend to say, okay, if I write a battle with 40,000 people, it's either going to get cut or they won't buy the script because they can't afford it. Right. But the interesting thing in our, and another thing in our capture of CG process is a, a second of film costs the same, whether there's 40,000 people in it or whether it's one character in a tight close up. It's the same. Now that's not true in live action. But we, our, our deal with what a digital and the way we approach it is, we know that the close up is as critical to the movie and as difficult to achieve with perfection and believability as 40,000 people crashing together in a giant zipper shot, you know, where, they, where the, the two armies merge. Um, and they're both equally critical to the film, both equally critical that you believe. In fact, I would submit that it's more important that you believe that closer than the battle. And some of those close ups, we should mention, are underwater, which I think is an extraordinary thing. It's not done through uh, the, the initial CGI. The actors are like, underwater, as we've uh, all heard about it, which I think is, that just blows my mind. If you see somebody doing something in a movie, whatever it is, riding a creature, diving down, in, anything in any scene, somebody's doing it. 80, 90% of the time, it's the actors themselves. Sometimes it's a double, sometimes it's a specialized movement double for some of the underwater stuff that 
that are people like from O or some Cirque du Soleil water show or something like that that are really accomplished multi years in, in the water kind of things. But um, it's a person. You know, we keyframe animate the creatures, like the Tukun and the and the Elu and so on. Um, but if it's a if it's one of the humanoid characters as opposed to a Tukun character, um, it was performed. And it was performed in water. If we're showing it in water, it was in water. And we had to train them. So we had Kirk Crack, an incredible free dive instructor, worked with the cast starting in, in May of 2017 before we started capture. And I uh, think it's the morning when we started the process. We're like, I don't know why you're on the breath for 30 seconds. And, and, and day one with Kirk, uh, she was over a minute. And ultimately, what did you get to? Six and a half minutes. Wow. <laughs> I just wrap up by, by bringing kind of back to emotionally and, and say, as we do.